Thank you very much. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I came in several days early. It's Thanksgiving in the United States, so we had Thanksgiving in Madrid instead. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Aaron Walsh. I'm the director of the Immersive Education Initiative. Uh, I'm also a faculty at Boston College in the College of Advancing Studies. And if you'd like to reach me on the website, there's a contact director uh, button. Uh, but first, before I get into immersive education and inside the initiative and the technology, uh, I want to extend a personal thank you uh, to Carlos and also to Michael. Uh, the, these things are difficult. My first question to Carlos is, are you awake? How do you feel? <laughs> it's a lot of work to get done. You saw the length of the proceedings and just the logistics. And uh, the details that went into getting here today were significant and compressed. Uh, the initiative announced uh, that the European chapter would come into existence at the Boston Summit in May. And as Michael noted, shortly after that, a call went out over the summer, a very short call, which generated a number of responses, and then the conference came together. It's very impressive. So there are a couple of key individuals, Carlos and uh, Michael, I'd like to thank personally. Also, the, uh, the Board of Governors of the European chapter, uh, who you got a moment to, to single out, and uh, the organizing committee of the event. So uh, it's, it's very pleasing to see this come together in such short notice. And as Michael noted, this reminds me of the very first Boston Summit that we had in 2000. It must have been four. Uh, it was a small group of dedicated people who came. Uh, everybody showed up who was interested, and it continued to grow. So it reminds me very much of that. I'm going to give an overview of immersive education and the initiative. You can get most of this off of our charter, and the charter link is there. It's immersiveeducation.org slash charter with a capital C. A brief overview, give a, an overview of the general mission of the initiative, uh, the membership, which is free and open, and how we deal with intellectual property and open technologies. There is a formal standards process. I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, the types of groups, how the work gets done, and uh, relatively new to the initiative are chapters. And so we'll talk about that. And as Michael had noted, uh, the European chapter is one of the very first immersive education chapters, and it is the first international chapter outside of the United States. So the initiative itself is a nonprofit collaboration of universities, primarily uh, individuals, consortia, um, libraries, museums, and companies that are working together to advance the use of immersion for education and training. Uh, currently, we started with about three or four hundred members when we launched, and uh, there are thousands now spread worldwide. And because of the growth and the continued growth of the initiative, you know, we felt it was important to establish chapters. And we're here today with the European chapter. There are a number of other chapters uh, that have been formed or in the formation process, and I'll talk about that uh, towards, the, towards the end of my presentation. Membership is free, and it is uh, an open community. And it is, uh, it used to be fairly restrictive, I'll say that. Uh, my presentation here is a, sort of the inside of immersive education. It started off very restrictive in the sense that we wanted a dedicated group of individuals who had experience in this space. Lots of people were excited and interested in it. But as soon as you get a community of people who are excited and interested, but not a lot of experience in this space, you start having tug of wars in which direction to go. Uh, the initial membership was limited. You had to provide a substantial set of credentials to show that you were involved in this area and had experience. Over time, as we've grown and as we've adopted chapters, uh, the membership is much looser. Uh, we allow anybody that's interested in it now to come and join and learn about it. We weren't at first that open. Uh, now we are. The intellectual property and the open standards process is particularly important. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, based on experience with immersive technologies that we effectively were locked into uh, in the 90s, the notion of open and royalty-free RF technologies became vital for platforms. And the platforms are the technologies that educators use to build immersive environments. And that is, a, is an important distinction. 
uh, a platform, a technology platform for immersive education is something that an educator would take to build a learning game on top of or they would take to build a virtual uh, learning space inside of. The notion is that a platform is the enabling technology that allows you to build these spaces. You may be using somebody else's, but ultimately it's not a finished product uh, as opposed to, say, a learning game that, that may be completed by a company that has been built and is done, you simply go into it and play it. Uh, that's not a platform. You're not building on top of that. So we make a really clean distinction between platforms and pre-made um, existing situations where you can use them off the shelf. And the distinction came from investing lots of time and lots of energy into building these immersive environments, but being locked into proprietary platforms. And that's happened over and over again. I think a lot of educators have uh, come to the conclusion that if they're going to build virtual spaces, put a lot of energy and effort into building the technology or rather the content and the courseware that goes into it, they want to own that completely. They want to be able to archive it, back it up, run it wherever they want and move it around uh, wherever they'd like. And so part of the core focus of the initiative is to promote open standards in this space o with open licenses and open source so that you can take your learning experiences anywhere that you go. One of the questions that often comes up is, what is open? And we actually have a very well-defined multiple point, um, in fact, you see seven of them here, multiple points of openness. And when a technology platform reaches all of those points in openness, then we will consider it for immersive education. And right now we have a number of uh, virtual world platforms. We have not yet settled on uh, mixed and augmented reality platforms. We have not yet decided on video game uh, development platforms. The first few years of immersive education, as far as the standards process goes, was focused on virtual worlds. That's where a lot of interest and activity was. Now that that's settled down a bit and educators are using virtual worlds quite a bit, there's not a lot of um, question about what, they're, what they are anymore. We're now starting to focus on video game platforms and mixed augmented reality platforms. We'll take a look at that in a moment. So as of now, as of today, there are only four virtual world platforms that are endorsed by the Immersive Education Initiative that meet all of those open requirements that I pointed to earlier. That's Open Wonderland, and we have a series of Open Wonderland presentations here. Uh, open Simulator, often called Open Sim, which can be considered a open uh, alternative to Second Life, Real Extend, and Open Cobalt. And Open Cobalt is the one that's probably the least developed in terms of its uh, ability to be used off the shelf and grab it. It's actually called Open, pardon me, Open Cobalt Alpha. It's very early stage, but it has some interesting capabilities uh, built into it. There are other platforms now under development, and there's some OpenGL platforms so that we, what we've noticed is the barrier to entry for a lot of schools is at downloading the software, installing the software on the lab computers, student computers, and getting out through the network. There's lots of problems. Higher education, not quite as much, but in the lower grades, before you get to university, there, especially in the United States, there's lots of uh, locks on network access and installing software. So we're now evaluating OpenGL platforms which will allow immersive experiences to come through the web browser on HTTP port 80. And there is at least one other uh, full-blown platform, VastPark, being evaluated as well. Those currently aren't endorsed, they're under evaluation. Uh, it's interesting, sort of the inside uh, look at immersive education. It's interesting to note that we actually were endorsing Second Life early on when we were first formed. Second Life was an immersive education platform. We did a lot of promotion around that. In fact, many of our events were done in world in Second Life. Uh, this was because the Second Life viewer, the client software that runs on your desktop and connects you into the virtual environment, that had been released by the company Linden Lab. It had been released under open source. And the company had gone on record uh, by most of their executives in print and in their own uh, materials saying that they would also open source the back end. So there was a good faith commitment from the company to open source Second Life and so we adopted it. We actually had a, quite a few vibrant discussions about whether or not we should, but the community ultimately decided 
we're using it a lot. It's already here. It's probably the most mature of all the virtual world platforms out there to date, and we've already got a lot of content in. Plus, the client, the viewer software, is already in open source, and the company is committed to open sourcing the back end. Um, once we went through those conversations and the membership spoke, we adopted it and started to promote it quite a bit. Uh, what happened, though, is several key points along the way over a several year period that led to us delisting Second Life and taking it off of the uh, endorsed platforms. Uh, ultimately, the key was that the back end, the server side, was never open sourced. In fact, uh, Second Life was packaged up as a commercial product, so we had been waiting for this, this product to be open sourced. It was uh, not open source, but it was released for 50,000 American dollars as an enterprise product. And so that was one major step in the wrong direction for us. We weren't able to get the back end opened up. Um, the other was that there was a terms of service change. Uh, because it's a commercial product, we were locked into basically a terms of service. If you use it, you have to go along with the terms of service. Terms of service changed, and what that meant was a lot of educators had content inside of Second Life that they couldn't easily get out. Um, and there was basically a mass exodus from a lot of the uh, educational community at that point. Uh, it's been fairly well documented, if you're interested. Uh, the, the Chronicle of Higher Education has done a number of articles on it. But ultimately, it came down to uh, us breaking our own uh, mandates early on in saying, we'll go on good faith, and then got trapped. And so we, at that point, said no longer can we endorse a platform that doesn't already meet these? It has to absolutely meet these criteria, and we won't go on good faith. And so in order for a platform to be considered, it has to meet all those open criteria. It has to already be there, not promise to be there. And um, as a result of what happened in Second Life, Real Extend and Open Simulator came to the fore, and we started to promote those quite a bit. All right, so I'll give some examples. Immersive education is a very large body of immersive experiences, virtual worlds, uh, learning games, simulation, and what we call FAM, full, augmented, and mixed reality. So I will try and give some examples here. Let's see. I'll just hold it down, try and mic it up here. So the first is, uh, this is Real Extend, one of the first major worlds that was built in Real Extend. Here is an aquarium. It was built as a demonstration of the Real Extend virtual world technology. And the distinction of the virtual world versus, say, a learning game is it's an open virtual environment that the end user can construct to their liking. In this case, in this case, it was a virtual aquarium. And what was significant about this is first, the graphics quality was outstanding. Um, there was also the ability for you to become the fish, so your avatar could change. And in this example, I'll let it play a little bit more, you could become any of the fish. Your avatar would automatically change. We started to use this as a way to give virtual field trips. One of, one of the very first schools um, was a what we call primary school up to about 10, 12 years old, and from a very poor part of America, most of the students were on government assistance, and the principal of the school came and asked, she said, well, we'd like to use this technology, how can we use it? And my question back was, well, what are your challenges? And she said, well, we have no money. She said, our students can't go to museums, we can't go to aquariums, we can't go to laboratories, we can't tour. She said, there's a zoo down the street from us. We can't afford to get our students on the buses to go to the, view, the zoo that's half a mile away. And so we said, well, why don't we start doing some virtual um, museum tours and some virtual aquarium tours. And this was one of the very first that these students who had never been in a virtual world before were suddenly seeing the fish, becoming the fish, and playing like a video game. There are some little mini games built in here. They were experiencing a virtual aquarium seeing fish that they had never seen before and they knew the names of them as a result and they knew what ate what and what the ecosystem was in this environment. And this was courtesy of the Real Extend virtual world platform.
They're the deep sea vents, the deep sea fish, and all the boys love the shark. Here's sun, uh, Suns, it used to be Suns. Uh, this is Wonderland, it used to be Suns Project Wonderland. Sun Microsystems, you may recall, is a big technology company. It was acquired by Oracle a couple of years ago. Inside of the lab environment, uh, there was a research team led by Nicole Yankelovich who will be doing some virtual presentations. Uh, they developed what they called MPK-20. This is one of the very first views of Open Wonderland, what we now know today as Open Wonderland. MPK-20 is a 3D virtual environment for business collaboration. So why is it called MPK-20? On our Menlo Park, or MPK campus, we have 19 buildings numbered MPK-1 through MPK-19. We decided to build our next building, MPK-20, in the virtual world. MPK-20 is built on top of a highly scalable game server infrastructure called Project Dark Star. Excuse me, Nicole? Yeah. Uh, I just noticed a typo on this slide. Oh, where's that? Um, bridge needs an I down the lower right. All right, I can fix that. Let me... Okay. And while we're at it, I think we should change the title. Okay. Uh, yeah, here, let me drive. Let's see if we can get this to change to maybe uh, MPK20 software stack. How's that? Let me show you around MPK20. This is our virtual team room. It's surrounded by virtual offices like the one we just came out of. I noticed John was working over here. Let's go see what he's up to. Hi, John. Oh, hi, Nicole. What are you working on? I'm just working on a new version of my conference manager application. I've put it up on the team room wall here so that other people can leave me feedback on some new screens that I'm working on. Our vision is that MPK20 will become the environment where people do all their real work. I'll, I'll fast forward. So Wonderland, in, in contrast to the other virtual worlds, was designed as a business application for collaboration and business work. The idea was there are a lot of remote employees at Sun Microsystem. How do you foster community and do work together and feel like you're face to face when you're not? That's how Wonderland started. One of the powerful things about Wonderland is the ability to run applications in the virtual world and then to collaborate and build together inside of those spreadsheets, word processors, PowerPoint presentation. Also supports very easy drag and drop content authoring. You'll see more of that throughout the next couple of days. We don't want people to have to use a separate tool to share applications. You should be able to simply share applications. They're going to work. speed this up. This is how fast Open Wonderland works. We're going to run around and talk to people. Okay, I'll fast forward to... Now, we can see somebody's in the room, and I can click over here. And here's an example of uh, NASA CoLab using virtual worlds to explore outer space. We do a lot of work uh, in what you'll hear Rocket World, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, space-themed. That's a big, big focus in the United States.
So I'll stop there. This was one of the first environments where we were exposing uh, young learners and college age learners to space travel, space themes, science and technology, which had become a very big focus of the United States uh, because our students uh, were falling behind in those areas. So we'd bring them into virtual environments and teach them how to build rockets, teach them about space travel, introduce them to astronauts, and give them an experience that they couldn't have in a physical world, the real world. Here's another completely, this one's built on open cobalt. This is a completely different type of virtual environment using a touch screen. These are young children learning how to count using the virtual fish. It's a very simple 2D drawing tool that kids can use with their fingers, don't have to know a mouse or a keyboard at all, and then they can drop it into the 3D world that turns into a three-dimensional environment. These were our young children creating virtual um, presentations to share with other students in their state that they've never met before. So as part of this learning experience, the students were to go around and identify the environment that they were in and then to build, using this very simple drawing tool, build the additional missing parts of the virtual world. What type of a tree is it? It's an apple tree. It should have apples. What kind of insects are needed to pollinate the apples and the trees? And they start to build ecosystem in this environment. For the kids, they don't really realize that they're learning an awful lot. They're just in a virtual environment, playing a game, doing something cool. But they are, in fact, immersed in a learning experience. It's just it's almost a stealth learning experience. They don't realize how much they're learning as they go along. I'll speed it up. So what you saw there was a touch screen, a very inexpensive touch screen. And it was a virtual world platform being used to drag and drop and play around. Um, we have a variety of other, and this is, this is becoming more uh, focused on the younger learner, but the idea of caves, fully immersive environments, were usually too expensive for schools to use unless it was in a higher education research setting. Uh, what we've been doing is some testing of low cost, what are called low cost corner caves. And the idea is that using commodity equipment you can build in a spare room, you can build a cave environment for a few thousand dollars if you have the right software and the right hardware. This one was built in South Park Elementary School, again the school that I was telling you didn't have the resources. Here is a Smithsonian project, this is a virtual watershed built in the real extended platform because of the graphics quality of this platform. So there's the Osprey. And the way this is used is the students, and it's actually frozen here, the students are commanding it on the computer. They're in the virtual environment, and then the teacher will stop it and then call on a student who's in the cave to come up and start talking about the different parts of the animal and what its purpose is and, and how it collects its food. And so the students are learning, again, about the natural world ecosystems that they would never be able to experience in the physical world because their environment is very different than this. They don't have watersheds and this type of animal life.
So you can see here's some of the early prototypes of the Maryland blue crab. You can see the high quality, almost photorealistic. It was the opossum. These are some of the very first objects that our group had created, uh, the Real Extend team had created for the Smithsonian project. It's a cute little opossum. I'll fast forward to this, so in the interest of time. And here, and again, a, another freeze quiz was made. The, the teacher stopped the simulation, called on a student. The student had to come out and talk about the opossum, its body parts, what it uses its tail for. And here they were uh, in the hibiscus on the watershed. So you get down at eye level with the plants and become one of the plants' animals. I'm going to close this down a bit. I'll just talk briefly to this. So here we had a landlocked in Colorado in the United States, a landlocked school uh, of kids who didn't have means to even go to their local zoo. Suddenly they were on the uh, Maryland watershed. They were, they were actually with research scientists from the Smithsonian. These are research scientists from the Smithsonian who were coming into their classroom telling them about what a watershed is, telling them about how these creatures live, the life cycle that's important there. Um, they spent about an hour coming into the classroom through this low-cost corner cave. I'll fast forward through most of it, talking to the students and engaging, and the kids lost their minds. They almost never have visitors come to them in the real world, but here they were talking to, you know, they knew about the Smithsonian. They heard about it, they, they hear the words, but the chance of them meeting an astronaut in person, the chance of them meeting uh, scientists from the Smithsonian, the chance of them being able to go onto um, the Chesapeake Bay, which is where this is, infinitesimally small. But because of immersive education, the technology was brought into the classroom and, and their, their boundaries were expanded. The students also began to make connections with college kids. So we have college mentors who are in the virtual worlds working with the students. And what that does is it, you start to form some friendships. Young students who didn't feel they had a future are now working with college students and they're kind of gradually given a path to higher education. I'm going to jump through this quickly. There we go. So, let me see if I can back that up a little bit. So behind Mark here, Mark Haddon is one of the research scientists at the Smithsonian. He's talking to the kids, showing them the turtle, the terrapin. Meanwhile, there's the real extend virtual world on the right. I've sped it all up. Uh, but you can see that that's the virtual environment and Mark is standing in the real environment. So the kids had a chance to walk through the virtual environment while they saw the real environment as well. I'll just jump through some of this. All right, so I'll give some other examples of full augmented mixed reality in just a moment. Um, how am I doing time-wise, Michael? Got about how? But the perfect. We'll we'll wrap it up. So this is just some general examples. There are also learning games that I didn't show, and I'll show some full augmented mixed reality in a moment. But a lot of the focus the past couple of years has been virtual worlds. Educators hadn't seen them before. The world really hadn't seen them before. And so there was this big rush to understand them, study them, and to start building learning environments. In fact, almost all of the, what I showed you there was based on virtual worlds. Uh, the difference between a virtual world and a learning game is in a virtual world, it, there is not necessarily a set of predefined goals or objectives. Games are, of course, games. You have goals, you have game uh, techniques that you apply to advance. Maybe it's collecting coins, maybe it's collecting information. Virtual worlds are much more open-ended and they are, they are amorphous in the sense that you can construct whatever you want inside the virtual world. A learning game is actually a pre-made environment that has some goals and objectives that you walk through. We have a, a number of learning games, but uh, being a bit short on time, so I won't go into, into the great detail. But there are some general examples of immersive education uh, being used. The basic process that we follow in immersive education is, and it's a formal process, there are technology working groups, TWGs. You'll see that all the time in immersive education. This is where the actual nuts and bolts work gets done. It's where uh, the 
best practices are defined. It's where the APIs, the application programming interfaces are defined. It's where the platforms are evaluated and selected. It's where there's a charter of objectives and a set of chairs and a group of people working together to produce what are called deliverables. The TWGs are where all of the work happens. Uh, there's an actual formal process that TWGs go through, including voting. And <clears throat> TWGs are open. Any member can propose a new TWG. So if there's an interesting area that we're not already addressing, a member can say, I'd like to start a TWG, a technology working group, in this particular area. The bulk of work, the technical work, happens in the TWGs. <clears throat> Pardon me. But a fair amount of conversation, probably the most discourse, happens in what are called community groups. And Michael had mentioned earlier that there was a conversation happening about how to select a virtual world platform. How do you choose from the four that we endorse already? And there is an open conversation going on about exactly that in one of the community groups. Community groups are uh, loosely uh, organized. There's no formal mandates. There's no particular charter that they follow. And they don't have to deliver anything. It's just for like-minded individuals to discuss topics. And in one of the community groups, the conversation that's currently happening is, how do I choose a virtual world? And in fact, today, uh, because of the past year's worth of activity, there are three new technology working groups that are being announced. And you'll get, an, you'll get a circulated announcement. After every summit, there is what's called an outcome. So you'll get an email that has broken down all the major things that happened at the European summit. A couple of those things will be these new groups. There's a Internet 2 group. I wonder if James is here this morning. James, James Worrell, if you'd like to talk with him about uh, Internet 2 and advanced research and education networks. There's a new technology working group that has been formed specifically for that. These are very, very high speed networks as opposed to commodity Internet. Gives you a completely different range of possibilities for immersion. That group is forming, a learning games technology working group is forming, and a full augmented and mixed technology working group is forming. I will, with just a couple of minutes of time left, show you a small example of FAM. So many of you are probably already familiar with full augmented and mixed reality. The notion of a mixed or an augmented reality is that you take a virtual environment and you combine it with a physical environment. And here is one of the very first prototypes that came from a collaboration um, in Singapore where these little markers, which are commonplace now, but several years ago, almost nobody had seen these. Here's an example of two of these markers or pictures being dropped into a youngster's hands. And they're not really 3D objects in his hands, but he's looking up at the screen, and here they appear. Here's a rocket in one hand and Earth's gravity field on the other. And one of the first questions he asks is, why isn't the gravity field completely round like the Earth? And that's when he realized that oceans and mountains and other parts of the Earth's terrain changes its gravity field. And the next thing he was doing was this, trying to connect the two. How does gravity affect this rocket? Uh, here are some other prototypes. In the upper left-hand corner, you see, and th this is a prototype, so the pictures don't match the symbols, but you see virus hunting going on. You see different viruses and different hosts being combined to see what happens when the two connect. And here we actually see that in this, in this particular engagement, the virus has affected the fish's nervous system and the fish is starting to react because it's been infected and it's going into paralysis. Same basic technology is being exhibited in the lower right-hand corner where, in this case, a sports car is being examined from all angles and customized, turned off and on. The color is being customized. Lights are being shown. Um, and then the same technology, I'll speed it up here, same technology for discovering the Jurassic era. Oh, well, you probably saw the dinosaurs going. So there's that combined with, that's what we call augmented or mixed reality. That combined with the cave environment, these fully immersive environments, is what the FAM group is all about. That's the full augmented mixed reality group. Let me just pull it back here. And that's launching as well. So there are a number of groups already uh, dedicated to various aspects of immersion in, for education and training. These are three new ones. Uh, you'll get an announcement as part of the general European Summit outcomes that will be circulated uh, typically within two weeks of the event. 
And then finally we come to chapters. And so as we started to grow, as I mentioned, we start off with a few hundred members, and within a few years we were several thousand, and hundreds, grew, hundreds of new members joining every month. It was impossible to keep up. And one of the things that we noticed was that based out of the United States with a fairly heavy United States um, membership, we couldn't really service the world. There were local needs and regional needs that we weren't even aware of, and it became a matter of importance for the initiative to basically set up autonomous chapters so that they could run themselves, identify what their issues were, run their own communities, and have their own summits. And in fact, in uh, May in Boston, at the Boston Summit, we announced that there were three new chapters opening. There was two in the United States, one was from Oregon, one was from Kansas, and one outside of the United States, which is a European chapter, which is why we're here today. The chapters have started to grow. We have several more under development, uh, Asia, uh, Brazil, um, New Zealand, and other parts of the world are forming their chapters, and so probably at the Boston Summit, several more will be announced as well. But the one we're at now is very significant. You're the first international chapter outside of the United States, who I think with a very good um, spread of, of board of governors representing a fairly large geographical um, span of Europe. So congratulations again to the chapter for just to get here today. It's pretty impressive. And one of the things that chapters do is they form summits. It's a formal event, and they also have workshops, um, lectures, and basically spread the word. And the last part I'll mention, and this is new, is the Journal of Immersive Education, which Carlos had mentioned uh, earlier. It's the official uh, publication of record for the initiative. Uh, it will be comprised of feature articles, which are shorter articles that are based on prior papers and prior summit uh, presentations. Uh, technology Working Group reports, we have a number of TWGs that are active, and this will be the place where they publish their routine reports. Chapter reports to report on what they're doing, what they've been doing, and where they're heading. Uh, summit proceedings, and uh, news, letters, opinions, and reviews. The inaugural issue is being prepared now. It'll be published in the first quarter of next year. It'll be available at JIED, JIED.org, and you'll get announcements about that as well. Uh, the first feature articles have already been selected. They're being uh, written now, and I'll, I'll walk through them briefly and then conclude. Uh, the first is by Harvard University immersive education members. Uh, Chris Deedy, who did a lot of seminal work in immersive education, is also a uh, senior editor and advisor on the journal. Uh, there's Stanford University has opened an enormous multi-million dollar immersive learning environment. Um, for their students, that was challenging, and they've overcome it, launched it, and they'll share the details of that with us. Uh, at MIT, there's a paradigm shift going on in electromagnetism, using virtual worlds as a way to teach this very sophisticated and challenging subject matter. At NASA, uh, there was, earlier in the Boston Summit, there was a keynote given by the NASA Technologies, NASA Learning Technologies Project Manager. Uh, he is going to write a feature about this, which is, what is the difference going from virtual learning to immersive education? What is the difference there? What is, what is significant about it? We've been doing online virtual education for many years now. What does immersion bring to the table? And then finally, there's uh, improving science assessments in the virtual, using virtual environments by a collection of researchers. Uh, initially started out at Temple and now spread to a number of universities. So, so you'll get uh, details about that uh, in follow-ups. And these are sort of the key things that drive the Immersive Education Initiative. And I was happy to be able today to announce a couple new working groups and also let you know that the journal is launching and will be uh, available for you in the first quarter of next year. So. Thank you again for your time. I hope I'm at least close to on target with my 40-minute allotment. Uh, and again, thank you to Carlos, Michael, and uh, the European Board of Governors for bringing us here today. Thank you, folks.